Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for those that are uh, tuning in on uh, social media uh, to uh, watch what is the first uh, in con on, a, on a conversation uh, that we will be having as a community, uh, the first of many as we move forward in this great city together as one people. Uh, before we get started, uh, I'm a I'd ask uh, Pastor Jenkins to offer us a uh, invocation, if he would. Pastor Jenkins. Father, we just ask for your presence to be with us. Uh, the scripture is very plain that if any man lack wisdom, we should ask. And so, Lord, we collectively, at the mayor's behest, we ask for your wisdom so that we might lead this community. Uh, Lord, we just pray for a reconciliation. You have given each of us the ministry of reconciliation, those of us that are believers. And so, Lord, use us as your agents. And we have an unprecedented moment. Uh, Lord, life can be summed up at times with moments collectively. And so Lord, in this moment, we ask for your strength, your wisdom, your empowerment, so that we don't fail to seize this moment. Lord, we believe you for not momentary emotional platitudes, but we believe you for long-term sustainable strategies that will bring flourishing to this community. Thank you for our mayor. We ask your blessing and hand upon him and all of the servants, civil servants that serve um, our community. We ask you to continue to prosper and bless them. And Lord, help us uh, to heal our city, bring unity and oneness, and as I said, flourish. We pray these things, these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Jenkins. Okay, uh, again, thank you, everybody that is uh, has tuned in. And I, I, I want to open this discussion uh, by acknowledging the circumstances in which we're meeting. Uh, it is absolutely critical that we urgently convene this conversation but it is problematic that, are we, that are we are doing so in the wake of George Floyd's murder at the hands of Minneapolis police. While it's many, meaningful and important for us to not let one more tragic death pass without taking a deep look inside uh, police reforms, I want to acknowledge that we should have convened this conversation much sooner under different circumstances, and we are sorry that we did not. I've watched as some elected officials across the country have attempted to parse this situation. They point fingers at Minneapolis and they say that the situation is somehow isolated. But we know that systematic patterns of white supremacy and racism, racism are not isolated and that the implicit and explicit bias remain frustratingly persistent across our country to this day. We also know that we have a moral imperative as individuals and as a community to do the work here and to approach this issue with an open mind, open hearts, and a posture of contrition. I'll speak briefly about some of the work that we've done in recent years acknowledging and understanding uh, that while it shows important progress, it's not enough. And we have to remain open to reforms and to reinvestments. At a high level, one of the r refrains that has emerged from the protest of George Floyd's murder has been the call for city governments to make investments in areas outside of law enforcement to better address issues upstream instead of having law enforcement be the back end response mechanism. These services include things like youth recreation, prevention, education, and nonprofit partnerships, uh, which can often result in better outcomes, a safer community, and fewer overall law enforcement calls. Many in our community have called, emailed, and have sent letters to my office regarding uh, what we are doing and, and what we have done to bring about change. I wanted to provide some uh, deeper information and give you an update. And while we still have a lot of progress uh, to make, I want to acknowledge a body of recent work in Gresham to advance our prevention and engagement uh, uh, efforts. I also want to acknowledge that Gresham's police staffing is traditionally and uh, comparatively uh, very low relative to other agencies. Uh, in Oregon, Gresham's police staffing ratio is the 15th lowest statewide. Additionally, the proposed budget that will go before the council next week for adoption includes a reduction of six sworn officers. In recent years, outside of our police services or in concert with the police department, we've made investments in families, 
We started a late night youth basketball program for middle schoolers and high schoolers. We created regular weekend futsal programming. Uh, we put city owned uh, land on the table to help bring partners like Boys and Girls Club, uh, Friends of the Children, um, and we also opened up uh, City Hall for family of friends mentoring uh, right in City Hall. Additionally, we've established uh, civilian homeless service specialists. We've created embedded uh, a civilian behavioral health team with the police department, and we've hired uh, civilian uh, gang outreach and prevention workers in partnership with POIC. None of the programs I just mentioned existed in Gresham even a decade ago. Uh, we, we have moved in the right direction, but we know that a lot of work remains ahead of us all. And that we also need to review everything from the use of force policies to collective bargaining agreements. And we need to push the state legislator help with collective bargaining and police reforms as well. To that end, I immediately signed President Obama's commitment to action pledge when it was introduced last week. The pledge commits us to review police use of force policies. It engages the community by including a diverse range uh, of input experiences and stories in the, uh, for review. And it requires us to report the findings and review it with the co uh, community to seek feedback and ultimately reform uh, our, our uh, use of force policies. We've already begun to embark on the first action, a review of the Gresham Police Department use of force policies. You may have heard um, about the uh, Eight Can't Wait uh, campaign that has elevated eight specific interventions to help stem police violence in America. Uh, that campaign is based uh, on community demands and policy recommendations from research organizations and President Obama's task force on 21st century policing. Here is what we have found in regards to the Gresham Police Department's use of force on those eight policies. Number one, chokehold and strangleholds. They are not allowed in situations where deadly force is authorized. They are not, they, excuse me, they are not allowed except in situations where deadly force is authorized. Number two, de-escalation is required. Officers are required to de-escalate situations where possible. The department's scenario-based training provides officers the opportunity to use de-escalation techniques such as using dialogue to calm a situation. Uh, these scenarios also help our officers learn when de-escalation is not appropriate, such as in dynamic and evolving incidents where there is increased risk to the public. Uh, number three, require warning before shooting. The Gresham Police Department trains officers to identify themselves and give warnings if possible. However, our current policy maintains that in some situations there is not sufficient time to give warnings. Number four, exhaust all alternatives before shooting. Uh, Gresham Police Department officers are trained to use deadly force when there are no appropriate alternatives. In the last 21 years, Gresham Police Department officers have been involved in five officer-involved shootings that have resulted in the death of the suspect. The department reports that there are thousands of incidents each year which offers, officers are legally justified to use deadly force, but officers do not. Number five, duty to intervene. Gresham Police Department officers are required to intervene and stop excessive force and report these incidents immediately to a supervisor. Gresham Police Department officers are also trained to recognize these circumstances and intervene before excessive force is used. Number six, shooting at moving vehicles. Officers may only discharge a firearm at a moving vehicle or its occupants when the officer reasonably believes there are no other reasonable means available to avert the threat of the vehicle or if the deadly force other than the vehicle is directed at, the, at uh, officers or others. Use of force continuum, the, number seven, the Gresham Police Department does not describe its use of force policies as a continuum. Many years ago, a continuum was used, but the department found that it created a situation where every scenario or event could not be addressed, and it proved confusing for the public. Again, however, officers are required to de-escalate situations uh, when possible. This item may need some additional exploration. Number eight, comprehensive reporting required. Officers must complete a report each time they use force, which is reviewed by an officer's immediate supervisor, their watch commander, their supervising captain, the chief of police, and survival skills trainers. Again, that is a, a summary of where we are right now, not necessarily an endorsement of any specific approach. I also want to reference the Statistical Transparency of Policing Report from the Oregon Criminal Justice Commission, which was published on November 25th of last year. Uh, 
This report, which is required by the state legislature, reviews uh, pedestrian and traffic stop data from all Oregon law enforcement uh, uh, agencies and searches for potential bias in the, in the statistics that are revealed. The Gresham Police Department uh, compared favorably in the report, showing that there were no statistically significant racial disparities in pedestrian and traffic stops on any of the three analytical methods used in the study. Deeper in that data, there are still opportunities to get better, uh, and we will continue as a community to examine those and get better together. But the, CJ, the CJC data and the 8 Can't Wait review, again, are just a start. In the coming days and months, we will continue conducting a comprehensive review not only of our police department's use of force policies, but also uh, their past efforts and future plans to build relationships and trust with the black community. And we cannot do that without everybody's help, and that's why we are here today. We know that this work uh, is, is already overdue and that it must commence urgently in our community. To that end, we have assembled uh, a panel of prominent black leaders to share their perspectives, their feedbacks, and their ideas for our community. We're here to listen. I also want to acknowledge that this panel is the first of many conversations that will occur uh, with black leaders in our community. Our senior manager, Larry Morgan, has been assembling names for additional conversations and, it, uh, uh, and is also urgently stepping up to lead our rebooted effort at City Hall to engage uh, uh, the diversity, equity, and inclusion work on a citywide, citywide basis. If you're interested in continued conversations, uh, please email uh, larry.morgan at greshamoregon.gov or call at 503-956-4245. In a moment, I'm going to ask a couple of my partners on the City Council to share some remarks, but, but before I turn it over, I do want to briefly introduce uh, the panel that we've assembled. We're very fortunate uh, to be joined today by our school district leaders. Uh, Centennial um, School District Superintendent Paul Coakley uh, is here. Gresham Barlow Superintendent Carice Pereira is here. We're also joined by com uh, uh, community leader Jermaine Flentenroy. Thank you, Jermaine, for joining us today. Uh, we're also pleased to have outstanding young leader Shamar Lennox, who leads the Stand Up Gresham movement, uh, which has organized some pretty powerful uh, rallies in Gresham. Thank you for being here. Um, and also, you, I introduced briefly Pastor Jenkins uh, from East Hill Church. Um, he has been a great ally to the city and the community in finding ways to help during COVID and his congregation. We want to thank them for that, and thank you for being here. Um, we're also very fortunate to be joined by Reverend Ed Mondenay, the president of the NAACP of uh, Portland, and J.W. Matt Hennessy with the Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church is here also. Thank you all for being here, and thank you for uh, uh, engaging in this conversation. I now want to turn it over to my colleagues uh, on the City Council. At this point, I'll turn it over to uh, Councillor Eccles. Thank you, Mayor Bemis, and, and to my um, fellow panelists, thank you for being here. Um, thank you for this conversation. I apologize. I will get through this. Um, I have had the honor and privilege to serve on the Gresham City Council for about 12 years now. I have seen great change. Um, a lot of good things happen, but we have not been transformative. And that is becoming very, very real. I want to tell you a, a very quick story about a dear friend of mine, and I'm going to name her Hannah because probably everybody knows her, but Hannah um, is younger than I, much younger. Um, she lives in Gresham, has her whole life. She identifies as Asian. And we were talking the other day and I asked her, how are you? And she's never been one to really talk about those kinds of things. But I said, have, how have, has things changed for you in this community since all of this? And she said, yes. And she gave me several examples, um, starting with um, COVID-19 being identified as the Chinese plague. She has taken horrendous verbal abuse while being in the community as a result of that. And now uh, in the, the tumultuous times that we're in compounded, um, she's experiencing even more. She's one of the dearest, sweetest people you could ever know. Um, giving, 100% giving. She works for pennies on the, on the, on the dollar 
to contribute to her community because it's her heart and soul. She was at, I'm going to say it, she was at Fred Meyer this last weekend in Gresham. And a couple approached her with their masks on and they had an empty bass cart and they approached her and she thought, you know, it happened so quickly. She thought, um, oh, they're giving me their empty bass cart. And when they got up to her, the man said to her, go back to your own country. You don't belong here. She's afraid to go out. She's afraid to go to Fred Meyer. She, she finds herself avoiding any possible situation that could be threatening to her. And I know that she, Hannah, is just one small example of what happens day in and day out here in this community. And it is not something that I experienced and certainly not something that I've been fully aware of. My colleagues on the City Council have been working on a statement truth of truth, intention, and commitment. I've received feedback from all but one of the counselors, so it is not in its final form. Um, but I do want to read it now. We have a goal, I believe, of um, adopting this on Tuesday once we have everyone's input. But I do want to read it now as a draft, if that'd be okay with you all. We acknowledge and own our, old, our role as leaders in this community to respond affirmatively and without excuse to the call for systemic change that roots out and challenges the status quo of racism, bigotry, intolerance, and discrimination. We commit to inclusion and welcome into our community all those who share this basic human value. We unequivocally condemn any form of hatred. We stand up against injustice through our words, writings, and actions. We aspire to understand through listening, observing, and doing our homework. We vow to seek truth and transparency regardless of how difficult it may be. We pledge to uncover and challenge all instances of implicit bias within our organization. We place education and training as the cornerstone of our commitment to meaningful and lasting change. We welcome peaceful demonstrations in our community. We steadfastly commit to the long and arduous road ahead and we declare our collective and individual responsibility to do this transformative work. I look forward to my colleagues here on, on the panel and to our community to um, hold it, us accountable to this. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Eccles. Councilor Palmero. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you, Councilor Eccles, for, that, for sharing your story. Very powerful. Um, thank you. Gentlemen and ladies for coming. Um, I want you to know first off that you have an ally within the mayor and the city council. I mean, records speak for themselves. The mayor's always been very supportive. Um, but as we, as we look at this, and as I, I'm thinking about this, um, this you know, conversation about rec reconciliation, how do we make things better, um, it always seems that something has to happen. And I think the mayor is right. We, sh we should have had this conversation a long, a long time ago. But it seems like always something has to happen before we, we sit down and talk. And we need to change that. And thinking about that, I mean, we have a, a growing African-American community in East County, in Gresham. And what can we do as a city to, you know, to, to help the African-American community? You know, it, and that just top of my head, just thinking maybe we could um, offer land or uh, buildings where African-American, culturally specific uh, communities can build their nonprofits so they can make decisions for their community as they see fit. Or maybe making sure, ensuring that our positions in the city reflect our community in terms of the uh, you know, number of, of, of diverse groups. Um, even being paid for um, consultations like this. I mean, the African-American community needs to be paid for what they do. And hopefully next time we have this conversation that you're all paid to come down and help us through this process. Uh, but those are just some thoughts. Um, I'd like to hear your thoughts about what we can do as a city. Very good. Thank you, Councilor Palmero. At this point, uh, next is uh, Superintendent Dr. Catrice Pereira. Thanks, Mayor. Um, just hit talk on that. There you go. 
Yes, sorry. <laughs> Not used to talking up here much <laughs> in, our, in our meetings. Um, thank you for inviting me and having me here today. Um, I've often said a lot of the roots of any problem that we have really truly in America begins in our classrooms. And many people say, well, that should begin at home. Well, yes, but I don't control home. Um, I'm a superintendent of a school system, and we have to begin there. Um, and so our school system is trying to take steps towards ensuring that our curriculum is reflective of our students in our, in our buildings. Um, and no matter how large or small those, those, those uh, culturally specific groups are, we're trying to make sure that we do that. We spent some time also with our, our staff, our teachers, over the last year and a half. This is my third year here as superintendent. Um, um, and I've had great pleasure of serving this community. But about a year and a half ago, we began uh, professional training and uh, development for culturally specific teaching and learning uh, so that our teachers are able to respond and ensure that their students feel welcome um, and they understand not only the cultural aspects of a student, but their social and political pieces as well. Because I think that's important. It's good to know about a culture, but it's also good to know about the social and political pieces which have brought us here today. Um, you have to understand those things and be sensitive of those. Um, and since I've been here in Oregon, there's been a lot of rhetoric about um, diversifying staff. And I say yes to that, but I say let's work with what we have first, right? Um, and we're also trying to ensure that we are cognizant of who we're hiring as well, because I also am a very much aware that representation matters in a classroom for a student. And you know, this is not Catrice's anecdotal piece. There's lots of research that points to the fact that when students have um, educators who look like them and can understand them on various different levels, they they will perform better. Um, but the reality is we are in Oregon, and I understand <laughs> there are droves of people, diverse people coming to Oregon looking for for jobs, which is why I go back to my original point, let's work with what we have as well uh, to ensure that they're prepared. And we've not had any pushback from that. We've been working with the Lewis, Lewis and Clark uh, Center for um, Equity and Inclusion as well, and the majority of our staff has also gone through uh, that training, including my cabinet. Uh, we actually began in Jan uh, December, actually, and we're continuing even through COVID. They're virtual, uh, rather than be in person, but they, it is what it is. Um, but I will end by saying this, is that what happens in our classrooms is good for our locality, it's good for our state, and ultimately good for our country as a whole. So I will go back to the, state, the statement of it has to begin with us in the classrooms. We can help with ensuring that students are not going outside of our classroom doing things that they shouldn't do because if we can teach them those things in a classroom, it's so much better. Um, and I say invest in kids. Uh, so that you don't have to take care of them when they become adults. So. Thank you, Dr. Pereira. Uh, Jermaine Flintenroy. <coughs> Hello, everyone. Hello. Thanks for having me today. And this is a um, very interesting moment in time for all of us. But for this moment in time, I want to keep this direct and straight. I want to say, how, why, and now. We got some understanding what we should be doing. We shouldn't be asking anymore. Like we got some clear understanding, some clear askings that I think we already know. Like I don't know why we sitting here having words and disputing. We already know what's going on. We're playing divide and conquer right now. We right here and we understand what's going on out here in the city of Gresham. We have been doing this work. We don't need to be asking how we do this work. We understand it. All of us know what we're doing out here. Now it's time to show us, do you really care for us? Is it about us or are we going to keep playing this talk? This is direct to the city of Gresham. Direct, honestly, what we're going to do, right? I just met that young man just today and tell him we got the program that's helped saving kids' lives. We work with the police. We make sure but that's a make-believe relationship. Are we gonna keep this 100 and make sure all matters? Do our kids count? Or are we playing games? We want a human right that no kid die out here. No black person die. It ain't gonna be asked no more. We're demanding right now. Straight up, you and I both know there's good cops and there's bad cops right here in the city of Gresham. What are we going to do about it? That's our demand. What are we going to do about it? 
right here. All, if we're gonna stand up and make this fair, fair, the resources must come to the community. They, it's a must they come to the community so we can make sure our young men have guidance. We already see that. He just need, like the, like the superintendent said, he need people look like him to really feel him, to guide him. That's simple. Because if he don't get that, he will be confused. That's understood down here. We already got that. We already got programs. We already got organizations. They need to be funded so we can make sure we have a re resilient, we building things right, you, we already know this. Like this conversation, we gotta keep this 100. We have to keep this 100 moving forward. From this day, we're gonna demand what we need out here. And we're not gonna ask, we're gonna demand. As much as mayor, I got much respect for you, Chief Sales, we're demanding now. All right? That's our conversation. Our next conversation will get realer and realer to see if we can hold you accountable. So we just don't have talk. Thank you. Thank you, Jermaine. I appreciate uh, uh, your comments. I hear you. And I hear you. Because I'm hurt. I'm going to worry about my kid. I'm hurt. Right? I got a 19 year old son. I'm hurt. I don't want to look out the house and worry about if he's going to get killed. Yeah, everybody knows. He's a public kid. He does. He respect. We get that. I don't worry, worry about if he's going to die. That's not what I got a four and six year old. I can't worry about if they're going to die. Not die. Right? Due to whoever did, die. That's a human right. I don't care. That's a human right. If you don't worry about your kid going to die, you can let your kid. I don't worry about my kid going to die. Not die. Thank you. Okay, Superintendent uh, Coakley. Uh, thank you for having me. And I also, um, I just want to say, uh, just like Jermaine, I'm worried for my son. I'm worried for every single um, African American student that walks through our doors um, that is in the city, it's in the city of Portland. I also agree with my uh, colleague. Catrice, we're doing the same uh, work. Uh, we work a lot together, and uh, we've brought a, um, a lot of uh, diverse leadership to our districts, and we'll continue to work on that. But the main thing uh, that I want to talk about outside of that is um, it does start in the schools um, with uh, educating and keeping kids safe. And I want to talk about the K-12 uh, funding. I know the economy based on COVID-19 has really um, took a hit. And before that, all districts were in the place of uh, working on uh, plans through SSA to really close and eliminate the achievement gap between um, our students of color and uh, uh, disproportionate discipline and achievement. And now, uh, based on the impact of COVID-19, we're looking at laying off uh, staff, cutting programs, and really uh, things that aren't going to benefit our students, especially during this difficult time. And I think um, that's something that we all need to be pushing towards, fully advocating for um, K-12 funding. Our students, we need our programs to continue. Uh, we need more support for our students. We need to close the gap. Um, just because uh, we're in a pandemic doesn't change the fact that um, we need to educate our students and get them to graduation and beyond. And it's not going to happen um, with trying to do more with less. And this distance learning, um, we've done I've seen educators step up across the state, um, all educators. I've seen uh, people try to engage students as much as possible, and not everyone learns that way. And I feel like our students are losing ground right now. Those are my thoughts. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Coakley. Uh, Shamar Lennox, Stand Up Gresham Movement. So I'm just going to go ahead and uh, <clears throat> share what I've written down for you guys today. It's gonna some of the topics that I'm speaking on. Uh, Mayor has Mayor Bemis has uh, touched on them already, and a lot of you guys have already said things. So I'm just gonna go ahead. First, I would like to thank Mayor Bemis for inviting us here today, and thank you all for being here and giving and giving us a chance to speak and be the voice for our community. I would like to say that everything I'm about to speak on today is all for educational purposes and to get the world and everybody in this room to understand. 
That being said, I would like to say, when somebody says black lives matter, they are not saying all lives don't matter. When somebody says black lives matter, that should be looked at as a cry for help. Black people all over the world are saying black lives matter to get you to hear their cry. Black people are simply trying to say, hey, my life matters too. And it's not to be disrespectful, but it's to shed light on what's happening right now in America. When you say all lives matter, that is changing the topic and avoiding something that drastically needs to be talked about and brought to light. Now I'm just going to list some facts that I have uh, looked up and this is cited from the Washington Post. Um, so it's time to get into the facts of what's going on in America right now. In 2019, 1,003 people were shot and killed by the police. That's just shot and killed by the police. That doesn't mean, you know, they, they weren't beaten or not. They're just shot. That was cited from the Washington Post. Now, this is a source from MappingPoliceViolence.org. Um, they state that there were 1,098 people killed by police in 2019 total. That being said, I think it's safe to say that based on these numbers, there needs to be some major police reform happening right now. Black people were 24% of those killed in 2019, despite making up 13% of the population. Reflecting back to the history of police, let's not forget that they started out as slave patrol in 1704. A lot of people don't know that, but history has a tendency to repeat itself, and it's safe to say it looks like we are moving backwards instead of forward, so we need to fight to continue to move forward. Black people are three times more likely to be killed by police than white people. Black people are also 1.3 times more likely to be killed unarmed than white people. Did you know that 99% of killings from police in 2013 through 2019 have not resulted in officers being charged with the crime? So where is the accountability at for police? What we, what we want, this is um, proposals pretty much shared with from me and Jalen, the other leader of um, the Gresham Stand Up Movement and also people from our community. So all officers required to have body cams on during public contact, failure to do so, results in a charge to the officer of evidence tampering or felony charges. Body cams are there for the officer's safety, but they're also there for public safety and need to be treated as such. Next thing is regular mental health evaluations of officers in contact with the public. This is important because if an officer is not mentally prepared to be in the field, then he does not need to be in the field. Next thing I'm touching on is independent review of use of deadly force from 2010 through 2020. This is important to build public trust because the police being transparent with us is the first step of many more to come. Um, the mayor, you already touched on this, but mandatory training and de-escalation techniques for officers. It is important for officers to know how to de-escalate the situation because it saves somebody from potentially being killed. All officers required to have a taser. Uh, me personally, I think this is important because a taser can shoot anywhere from 15 to 31 feet. This means officers would have a less lethal solution opposed to grabbing their gun, which could prevent somebody from, from getting killed. Um, mandatory, training uh, mandatory training and classes on racial profiling. This is important because if police are taught what this is in depth, then it could potentially eliminate it from happening. Um, jurisdictions should make their policies and procedures that their officers have to follow available to the public. This is important because the public can then hold cops accountable for their actions and fight for justice. Jurisdictions sh should release statistical data annually related to arrest-related deaths and arrest-related hospitalization injuries within each jurisdiction. This is important as well because it's holding cops accountable and giving criticism to see where they can improve. Next thing is make body cam footage available to the public in cases of arrest related um, death and arrest related hospitalizations. Doing this gives the public a better chance at holding a law enforcement account accountable for their actions and provides evidence of what happened for transparency. Cops need to keep their partners in check. If you see somebody doing wrong, you need to stop fellow officers from doing wrong. This is a major difference maker because it saves somebody from being unjustly beaten or murdered. Failure to stop your partner or responding officers from doing wrong should result in termination or criminal charges. That's all I have for police reform. I'm moving on to um, a couple thoughts of mine for school reform and ideas for schools. We have a lot of superintendents in here, so I'm just going to throw out some ideas for you guys. If teachers are aware of discrimination and don't do any, anything about it, they need to be terminated effective immediately. Um, I know schools promote anti-bullying but and anti-discrimination, but not anti-racism. I feel like this personally has to change. 
Barlow High School has an has American outs and hick outs. Barlow High School is also known for being openly racist. The school board needs to needs to ban American outs and hick outs effective immediately so students, viewers, and players feel safe and respected at games. Principals need to enforce zero tolerance for racism in their schools. If they've been informed about racist comments or outbursts by students and don't do anything, they need to be terminated immediately. If a student makes racist remarks, the school needs to expel them immediately. This is establishing a new standard in our schools so minorities feel safe when they go to school and don't have to worry about getting harassed. This is the last thing I'm going to share. Schools need to have mandatory classes on racism and white privilege. Um, this is important because if our peers understand where the people around them are coming from, they can stick up for them too. Thank you. Thank you, Shamar. Uh, Pastor Jenkins. Thank you, Mayor. Um, it's an honor to be here with all of the panelists. Um, uh, let me acknowledge right out of the gate something that maybe many of you don't know. I've been in the community for six months and uh, I still feel like I'm in an introductory stage. Um, so for me, being here um, this afternoon is, is furthering my education on our community, community leaders, um, strengths and weaknesses of our city strategy. Um, I want you to consider uh, East Hill um, a community partner, uh, someone that um, we've, we've tried e initially during the crisis to make sure that we're positioned um, to do everything that we can to serve the communities, um, those that are disadvantaged, those that um, are underserved. Um, and so in that regard, um, we, we are, we're going to continue that effort and, and hope to strengthen that partnership. Now, while I've only been in the community for six months um, pastoring, I have been a black man in America for 54 years. And so there is a journey that I have had as well. And um, some of the, it's, it's amazing to me that I grew up in East Baltimore. It's amazing to me to hear some of the same um, uh, needs for the African American community that we were espousing um, some 30 years ago. Um, even to the point of midnight basketball that I hear someone saying, I played midnight basketball in East Baltimore to stay off the streets and away from drugs and violence. Um, uh, but, but I would say this, uh, I've pastored in Eugene, Oregon, and now in the Portland metro area um, for roughly about 16, 17 years. And in our transition to try to move to East County, we, my wife had an experience that sort of allowed me to understand where we were moving to. We uh, contacted a homeowner. Um, everything seemed fine over the phone until my wife showed up on the front steps. Uh, noticed that there were two cars in, in the driveway and could hear people moving around in the house, but the door was not open to her. Um, we could only interpret that as being that someone saw who we were, what ethnic group we belonged to, and somehow did not want us to rent, lease their property. And so um, that's just a small um, experience that we've had. Um, I've had numerous experiences with police in um, Oregon. Uh, my son is a 6'4", uh, 300 and some odd pound African American young man who routinely um, gets stopped for, he seems to fit the description a lot in Eugene, Oregon. And likewise for me in, in the Portland area. And so for me, um, we've got, I represent a diverse church, a relatively large church. We have law enforcement officers in our church. Um, we have everyone, and increasingly I've been told that our church is becoming browner by the weeks, and some of that has to do with the affinity that some feel to my leadership. Um, but so I represent this coalition of diversity in our church, and um, I would say to you that we want to be part of the solution. I want you to look to us, lean on us um, for counsel, and not necessarily even in the public forum. I'm not um, a, a soundbite type of person. So when you need us, we will be there. You don't always have to put me on front and center to um, advocate. And so um, I'm here to learn. So keep, uh, when I hear Jermaine's pain, when I see and hear, um, I have several friends that are Asian American um, who have had likewise similar experiences. Um, I think what we're lacking is, is simple human decency. Um, we are not seeing humane treatment. We, for those of us that espouse our faith, we espouse um, what Paul wrote in Ephesians 2 of a new humanity, um, one that is characterized by love, um, that um, distinguishes even the differences. Though we're not uniform in thought or strategy, um, we maintain a, a heart for unity and oneness. And so that's what I bring to the table for us, Mayor. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, Pastor. Um, and now, uh, E.D. Modine. Good morning. I appreciate the opportunity to be in this space with all of you. Uh, this is probably one of the most important times of our generation. We're in the middle of a revolution. There has been a reset button pushed and uh, it's not going to get unpushed. And we're going to have to understand that Jermaine's pain is not just a pain, it's a reality. It is tragic when a race of people arrives at the realization that they are powerless. Powerless, powerlessness is the worst form of oppression. It drives people to perpetuate not only their own sufferings, but that of others. In America, where black people continue to find themselves powerless, our community often doesn't see the point of participating in what we call the great democratic process. There's a convincing narrative that suggests we will never win this struggle and that our participation serves no impactable purpose. This despondency in the attitude towards democratic institutions manifests itself in many ways including depressed, voter turnouts everywhere, and a lack of voice in the public square. We live in a time that perhaps more than ever calls for us to rally our courage to be better and to do better. Our COVID era exercises in social distancing still provides us an opportunity uh, for us to tighten our social bonds. And now more than any time in recent history, our community must summon the level of effort we displayed during the civil rights era. We must unify and bolster our capacity for effective organization. This need is very plain to see. We've heard it echoed by people on this panel all morning. Since the start of this pandemic, high profile tragedies for the black community have continued unabated, playing out in the national news. As, the, as our community continues to be terrorized, I begin to ponder whether we are still de facto three-fifth human. I admit that there was a brief time in space uh, that I had more optimistic uh, uh, reasons to think that we were going to get better. I maintained a regular hope in the potential for progress. In our centuries-old fight for equality and inclusion, I'm hoping that there's still opportunity. But as time goes on, those hopeful thoughts in the best of mankind have been dashed against the harsh rocks of reality that exist in these United States, reaching the same conclusion as would any other observer that racism, my beloved friends, my beloved community, is still alive and well, albeit often found in the form of politically polished and politeness, systemic institutionalization of white supremacy exists. And as I close this portion of my statement, I say unto you, my friends and those that listen, that it is not incumbent of any black man, black woman, or black child to lift up the voice of fight for racism. 
that fight belongs to our fellow constituents that bear a different skin tone. Albeit you have these conversations in the public square, it is time that we had these conversations at our dinner tables with our wives and our husbands and our children, with our parents and our cousins and our aunts and our uncles, when we hear the freedom to insist that the ways of thinking in our families must change, we'll see a push that we have never seen before. It is time for us to rise up our heads and begin to understand that the uh, two diseases that plague us right now are real, COVID-19 and racism 2020. Thank you for having me here today. I'm glad to be here as your friend, your ally, your accomplice, and most importantly, your brother. Thank you very much, sir. J.W. Matt Hennessy. Thank you, Brother Mayor, and to all of those who are panelists. I have really thoroughly appreciated everything that everyone's had to say. Brother Mayor, you are a wise man to end this with three preachers, because if you had let us go first, nobody else may have gotten an opportunity <laughs> to speak at all. To those that are listening as well, uh, I'm humbled and honored to be a part of this conversation today. But I want to say today that my remarks, I pray, you will listen to through the lens of a father, a grandfather, a former global leader at Nike, a former CEO of a company in Lake Oswego, a former public safety director in Michigan, former city manager in Michigan, former leader of International Preschool Education Foundation, present leader of Ecumenical Ministries of Oregon, present convener of the Interfaith Peace and Action Collaborative that's been working with the Portland Police Bureau for many years, present pastor, CEO, and senior servant of historic Vancouver Avenue First Baptist Church in Portland, godchild of Coretta Scott King, Dr. King's wife for 20 years. Have lived in Oregon more than half my life. I've given 32 years of my life to this region. I have been fighting this battle of suffocation, of racism for more than, or all of my life, but 32 years here in Oregon. And so today, to preface my remarks, I'm really thinking and moved by the statements of history. One is President Anwar Sadat, as I had the honor of being across the street in Lafayette Park when the Camp David peace accords were signed between him and the Prime Minister of Israel and our President at that time, Jimmy Carter. I was a college kid, but I was across the street and I will never forget, President Sadat said, this is the happiest day of my life. I watched as a college student, President Ronald Reagan stand at the Berlin Wall and say, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down this wall. That inspiration today is exactly what keeps me going. Somebody sent a message, I want to know that you're all right. I said, I am as all of us are, working from beginning of the morning, as, as was it Malcolm X that said, can't see in the morning till can't see at night. I said, but what fuels me is hope. We are right where we belong. I am not only hopeful, Jermaine, and everybody on this panel, I am absolutely clear that God has spoken. 
and that indeed this midnight in this country and in all over the world, this midnight is beginning to see a brand new dawn. I say to you as a leader in higher education, as I've spent 13 years of my life in a seminary, seminary board and a private um, uh, educational uh, school in Santa Barbara, I believe that this is the time that Goliath will die. Y'all didn't hear me, so I'll say it again. I know I'm not preaching to Vancouver Avenue, but Goliath must die. Every Goliath must die. Racism is that Goliath as well. It is suffering right now. And Brother Mayor, our prayers for you is your safety. Because the white power structure is not willing to give up that easily. It's going to fight you. And I want you to know that we are your brothers and sisters. We're going to fight alongside you. We're not going to abandon you. But I want you and the city commission to know you are embarking on something that while there are plenty of people that support you, there are plenty of people that do not want to see this succeed. Yes. I have members, while I'm, my church is in Portland, yes. I've got a bunch of members that are here that live in Gresham and make their home here, which is why I'm grateful to be a part of this conversation. But I also want to go beyond police reform. What I know is that there are plenty of great police officers, and I want to say that for the record. I work with them. I talk with them. I've been working with them, been riding along with them, been working on policy with them for a long time. There are also some bad apples. Let me pause for a minute. There's some bad preachers, too. There's some bad politicians as well. So let's not just say they're bad police officers. There's some bad everywhere, okay? But what I want to say is that as we do this work, we have said to the world that no longer are we going to be afraid to go places. There are states in this union that if we're honest, those who are black and brown, we wouldn't even dare go to them because we realize that we would not necessarily be safe. There are places in Oregon that we would not go to after the sun goes down without giving it great consideration. But I also want to say that I'm grateful for the words that you have shared and others, Mr. Mayor, have shared about nonprofit work. But I need to, as a former business leader, understand that's not enough. Part of the problem of this country is economic empowerment, and it is completely lopsided when 1% of the people own 99% of the wealth. Amen. Something is wrong with that. So I want to say to business leaders everywhere, all over this country, make the space for people that don't look like you in your organizations, at your boardroom table, at your, uh, in, and not just in diversity and inclusion. I have, believe me, I, trust me, don't anybody get me wrong, that's important. When I went to Nike, they tried to offer me a job in HR. Four jobs, we, they said. Uh, three of them are in HR. I said, well, I don't want either, any of those. I want the job that's right in the center of your work and what you do. That is important. We must force, demand, as has been said here today, the business community to quit hiding behind the walls and recognize that you will also increase your brand equity by making sure that you make decisions that are consistent with diversity and inclusion. Police officers, you want us, that if, you, if we see something, you want us to tell it or say something, we need you to do the same thing. We need you to recognize that as busy as you are, get out of your car and say something to the people around you. I'm grateful from Rodney King to where we are today that people start filming stuff. Because see, I'm convinced that if we had not seen the film 
of what happened to Mr. Floyd, that would have been covered up. Y'all may not agree with me, but I'm telling you right now that it's amazing to me how many things have been covered up because there is no film and something's desperately wrong with the grand jury system when an officer can go into the grand jury system and clearly say, I felt my life I felt my life was threatened, and that is the hook that gets them off from whatever activity was on the street. That must also die. And so I say, as one um, local leader of a large governmental union, unit called and asked me what I thought, I said, here's what I want you to do. I said, you've got black and brown people that work for you, that have felt suffocated, just like the metaphor of that officer's knee on Mr. Floyd's neck. They felt and have had to conform because the white power structure has made us do that. They can't tell you what they really feel because they're worried about losing their job. But I want you to be courageous enough to go talk to them. I want you to be courageous enough to tell them you will not lose your job and that you will talk not only to them but their supervisors or that you will talk with leadership and help them help you understand. And I say this to you, Brother Mayor, and I say this to everyone who's listening. Talk with your people. I promise you, if you make it safe, they're going to tell you the truth about the injustices that they have seen and that they live with every day, but they don't say anything because they've got children that have to go to college. They've got car payments and mortgage payments that they have to make. Say it again. <laughs> they, they recognize that they need to be in a safe space, but I need you, we need you, to open up the doors of conversation so they can tell you exactly how it is. Exactly. And, and don't hide behind the statement. In fact, I pray that this statement will die too, and that is, I'm not a racist. This ain't about whether you're a racist or not. The reality is, are you willing to work hard to make sure that there is equity and justice all over the place? An opportunity for people, to, for you to quit getting defensive when somebody calls you a racist, what you don't know, and what I know and you know, is that what people think of you has absolutely nothing to do with what you think. It has to do with what they have experienced on the other side of you. You may not have meant to be racist, but your actions have been racist. And it's important to be able to say, I am as guilty as anybody else. Please talk to your employees. Please talk to your residents. Please open this conversation to business leaders. Please continue to open it to police and fire and others and be willing to take the courageous steps intentionally to make this happen. I'm just about done. Passage need three closes, but that's the first one. When I was a city manager, I will never forget when I asked the IAFF, why don't we have any women in the fire service. And they said, and I won't give you all the stuff, they said, because our wives would be uncomfortable with that. I said, well, that's crazy. That's, I threw that out the window uh, because they had to sleep in the same dormitory. I said, what are the problems? Because there have been women who have applied to be a fire, uh, a fire uh, person, but why don't they get through? They said, well, what we found is that they don't pass the obstacle course. I said, great, do me a big favor. I said, I want you to put the obstacle course together and I want you, the union, you pick any of your firefighters and have them go out and I want them to do the obstacle course. They happened to be all men and they happened to be all Caucasian and they took them through the obstacle course and you can imagine what happened, they all failed. I said, so what you have created is a barrier. I said, we have four positions open right now, and I'm not going to fill two of those positions unless you've got women who will come through and be hired, and you can take me to mediation, you can take me to arbitration, I don't care what you do. 
we have created the barrier that they will not get through. So you need to toss out the obstacle course. Long story short, we found two women to be hired. But it took force. It took courage to say, this is what we're going to do. Brother Mayor, I say to you, as a public official, your words are great. I believe you. I feel you. But I want you to take the courage to do what's necessary. And it's going to take that. Finally, my friends, as we do this work, I pray John 17. As Jesus made his prayer to God that they would be one, talking about the disciples and by extension all of us, that they will be one as we are one. It's God's force. And if you are not a person of faith, uh, I promise you today, this work can't be done if what you are doing is assuming that you've got all the ability to do it on your own. We do not. You need a force bigger than you. So I would just ask you and beg you as a, as a Baptist pastor, but really a child of God, that whether you choose to be Muslim, Jewish, Buddhist, Sikh, whatever it is that you feel called to do, you need a higher power because that's the only way we're not only going to get this, but stick with this and make the revolutionary change that needs to be made. I hear the voice of the woman at the end of the Montgomery bus boycott that she refused to take a ride in the taxi cab. A grandmother walking to work in the hot Montgomery sun. And when the cab driver tried to force her to get in the cab and tell her she would not have to pay, she insisted on walking. And she said when he asked her, why are you walking when you can get a free ride? She said, my feet is tired, but my soul is at rest. Today, my friends, we've started a journey. It's going to be a hard one, but we're going to walk this journey together. And our feet may get tired, but I pray our soul will always be at rest. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Powerful words. Thank you. I thank everybody for their frankness, their openness, the discussion. I also thank you for the accountability mechanism. I hear you. I hear all of you in terms of accountability. Words are great, but we got work to do, right? And I'm committed to doing that work. I know that our council is absolutely committed to doing that work and we will do it and we will do it as a community together and that's the only way that that will that it will be sustainable we could we can you know make some moves here and there and and put some dollars to resources right and 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 then next budget cycle it's gone if we don't do it together we've got to do it as a community and we've got to do it with all of the people that you identified Jermaine all of the people you all identified, and I'm hoping that you all will stay willing partners with us as we move through the conversation together. Um, it is definitely going to be tough work, you know, but we have a moral imperative. And I know that whatever as my words are my words, and I hope that you believe me. I hope that you trust in me based on my past actions. But I also am fully aware of, the, of where we are and that actions are required. I'm fully aware of that. I'm also fully aware, you know, that not everybody's going to be supportive. And you know what? I don't care. Um, I just don't care. We have so much work to do. And when I hear the stories, you know, of, of you talk about your kids, right? Kids are the entire reason I got into this line of work. And... It's what keeps me 
in this line of work. We have, when, when I think about you letting your children go out for the night, I, I know what I feel when my children go out at night, and I know how scared I am that they're going to return safely, and that isn't even overlaying the fact of a society and, and sometimes of a department that isn't protecting them. And I can't imagine that. I cannot imagine that. We have said for a long time that hate is not aggression value, that everybody in this community is welcome, that everybody has a role to play going forward. That is where we're at. What is our role going forward? Everybody is in this conversation. Everybody. There is nobody that's not in this conversation. Every single person. Every single person in this community has a role to play. I believe we can get it right. I believe we can get it right. I believe we can get it right. We have Oregon's most diverse zip code. We have spent a lot of time trying to build systems around the communities. But it, as I said in the beginning, it's short. It's not enough. We are at a moment in time, as has been identified, where it's time to meet the moment. It's time to lead. And I say that to my white brothers and sisters. Enough. You have a responsibility. You have an obligation. And I know, I know so many hearts that want to do good, that are afraid to talk about this stuff because they're afraid they're going to hurt somebody's feelings or they're going to be, um, somebody's going to judge their heart and that stuff. And, and I say to that, enough, get over it. Get your butt in here. Let's break some bread with some people. Let's talk. And let's figure this community out. We, we will convene, obviously, as many of these as we need to convene. And I don't ever see them going away, to be honest with you. And Again, the accountability is the question. It is the question. It is the question which I want you to put on me and on this council. I want that accountability. Okay? I will walk with my brothers and sisters every day, anywhere, anytime. My faith tells me to do that. My God tells me to do that. And I know the hearts of the council and I know what their heart tells them to do too. So in spite of where we are, we have an absolute incredible opportunity. We have a credible opportunity to reshape systems, to bring people together in a way that I think can be very meaningful. Because I know the hearts of everybody that want to, take, that, that want to get better. Right? Like, I know the hearts of everybody that wants to get better. The moment demands it, we will meet it. And with that, E.D. Modine. Social commerce and social capital is the art of the day. Conversations are great and they're important to change ways, habits. Social cognitive implicit bias is what it is. But until we change systems, laws, procedures, the drum of injustice will keep beating and we will not see change. So we have to lobby, 
push, insist, and demand on legislative difference and inclusion unless we dismantle the constitutionary, the borrowed constitutionary ways that we felt uh, were uh, amended by the Civil War and then the Bill of Rights and then the uh, uh, Civil Rights Act, we still didn't see the change. So we have to understand that there's something even deeper that has to be done. We've got to change the law. Above all conversation, laws must be changed. Systems must be reconstituted. And we're going to see the needle move for justice after that. Thank you. With that, we'll now move to questions of our online uh, viewers that may have questions. Al Jubitz uh, came to one of our meetings recently. He said there is online a, a link that says uh, it's for it says 75 ways or 75 things white people can do to um, end racism or to uh, be more conscious of race issues. There's a woman in uh, Portland called Donna Maxey. Donna has been uh, leading race talks for 10 years. Uh, racetalks.org, I think, or racetalk.com, I'm not sure, but that is online. You can also do that. She had, a, um, she had something up uh, online with 300 people who joined, three or 400 people who joined her last Monday, a week ago Monday. Final thing I would say, if you can't read anything else, Go to Just Mercy, written by Brian Stevenson. Brian Stevenson has four key things. Be proximate, change the narrative, be willing to be uncomfortable, and never give up on hope. There's another resource called uh, BeTheBridge.com. You can find it on BeTheBridge.com, really good. Um, cohort form uh, of learning. I think it'll be good as well. Uh, there's a book that I've used with our staff that is called, that uh, we're actually going through by uh, Dr. Brenda Salto McNeil um, called The Roadmap to Reconciliation. I think is really a foundational book as well. Next question is directed towards the superintendent that we have here today. Callie R says, I have three kids in the schools. What are your plans to protect my brown kids? What will be done with SROs in schools? Sure. Um, it's Catrice Breyer Gresham. Uh, for SROs, um, again, that's for me um, in Gresham. It is a greater conversation for our community. Um, I do not have that sole authority as the superintendent to remove SROs from our schools. Um, it is a contract with our school board. Um, we will begin those conversations. Um, and since I arrived here in 2017, at the end of every school year, <clears throat> myself, my principals, um, as well as my safety director, sit down and have conversations with our um, SROs to recalibrate what's happening and what's going on. Going forward, I know the uniform itself kind of brings some and some haste for kids and knowing all the things that are happening now, uh, we're looking at asking our officers to wear the police polos. Um, and we will continue to have discussions about um, the deadly weapons that they adorn um, throughout our buildings. Uh, but again, to me, for me, it's a, I'm speaking for Gresham, I don't want to speak for Paul, um, it's a greater conversation in our community because we also knew the reality here in Gresham Reynolds, Gresham, 
Park Rose, we've all had school shootings, right? So, and I'm not saying that having an officer will prevent that, but we also know that the response time is critical in those scenarios. Um, and so I think it's a greater conversation that the community, um, and I'm not in the position to give a yay or nay on that um, as and I'm, a superintendent. Uh, I'm in agreement with that. With Centennial, it's the same exact process. Um, also, uh, we do the same review, and actually we only have one. And um, I would say that uh, it, he's been uh, consistent in uh, building relationships. And, and when I think about it overall, I feel like um, calling for help with um, someone we don't know on an emergency, um, that first responder in the building is, is actually going to be um, more aware of students, staff, and also he's just going to be there. But I think it's just an overall process that we would look at and follow, and it's the exact same one that Gresham follows. Will you allow me to just say uh, 60 seconds? I am grateful to hear these two superintendents say what they said. My concern for the decision that was made in Portland is I didn't hear that young people were consulted. And I think their voice needs to be in the conversation. I have marched the streets in Portland with young people. I have heard them, and in the park, rally. I've heard them say awful things about police. But guess what happens when the school resource officers show up? They're okay. That's the answer, they're okay. And what we know statistically, 92% of the issues that occur in the Portland schools where they're school resource officers, they can manage it right there. We just, those don't get into the criminal justice system, and all of us ought to know, any of our kids getting into the criminal justice system is a mess, and we need to understand. And what I said the other day is just like the crime bill in 1993. Everybody was on board. Everybody's on board. 20 years later, we find mass incarcerations. Guess what? Nobody was thinking about the other side of what happens when you make a decision like this. So I am not in support in, and in favor of that, and I say that as an educator myself. Um, I would, I would uh, like to also add to that, we just had our first uh, graduation with uh, social distancing that wasn't our normal coliseum. It was, it was at the high school, and it was to um, keep students safe, and I watched uh, all of our students and our students of color giving air high fives to our resource officer who was there for the entire time to make sure that everybody was socially distanced and also that it was a smooth graduation. And I um, also just want to say uh, go uh, class of 2020. <laughs> the next question, um, Malcolm P says, I'm a young black artist who has felt profiled and targeted by white people in East County. What will you do to ensure Black Lives Matter? I think the the first part of that is to making sure that the systems that we have in place that would do that profiling are not doing that, right? That we have this community conversation. We know what has to happen in terms of reform. At least we think we know generally what needs to happen in terms of reform. But to the point that everybody has made, the systems have to change. And until we can total in totality change those systems, you're going to have the issues that we have. And so the work of bringing people together as i see it and having these conversations um followed by action followed by plans um followed by you know community and, and again i don't think it's for us it's not obviously these are elected leaders of gresham but this is a big area right like we have east county where you know there's a lot of um, diversity resides in other cities too that may not have access to some of the resources that we do so i think it's incumbent upon us to make sure that we're talking about everybody in our in our region at least in in east county because the fact of the matter is if somebody feels profiled they're going to feel profiled you know if they're not profiled in gresham but are profiled in another city that doesn't work right when we're going back and forth so again i i don't have all of the answers other than to bring people together and to try and figure it out as we go forward and make sure that if systems are in place where that's happening that they're addressed immediately
Because me personally, <coughs> I will say what you say, and I will make sure they know who I am. So the most important thing for us is to be the even though we say the police officers come as the person we want to serve and protect, we need to let them know in a kind, nice way that any human being that who you are. He needs to get to know police officers. So the day when they see him, they know oh, he's okay. He's cool. <coughs> Outside of them getting out the car <coughs> and saying, you know, let's go deeper. Because he went through this two years ago with kind of talk, kind of listen. So what they need to happen is make yourself known. And if you feel like once you make yourself known and, and they have the barrier, there's ways to talk about that. There's ways to address that issue. You're trying to be in a place where you want them to know, I'm okay, knowing you. So when you get that barrier right there, oh, there's something that needs to be talked about. That's all I have. You're absolutely right, and, and um, we've often said that the validity of a police officer can never just be the badge. It has to be the work that's been done in the community prior to the interaction. And I think Dr. Coakley's um, iteration of the SRO and the relationship that's built and how that's different um, proves that point even more to the point that you just said, which is how do we get people in community together more often? Next question. Michael S. says, I'm a believer who is grieving what I'm seeing. What hope can you offer? What can I do for my black and brown neighbors? I like hearing believers that say, what is it that I can do? The greatest power that any believer has is the power of prayer. As a believer, we need to understand that now faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence for things that are not seen. For by it, the elders have, uh, have received a good report. I'm here to report to you today that there is hope. And not only is there hope, there's power in prayer. So I'm grateful for the believer that asked that question. I would also say, uh, much like we see in the incarnation of Christ, since it is a believer, um, the initiative, the divine initiative of God to move toward hum broken humanity. Yes. I think it is incumbent upon us, those of us that are believers, that we um, do the work that is necessary to have our souls refreshed. I have lamented. I've been angry. Yes. I've been downtown in Portland with young people as yourself and other faith leaders. Um, and at the same time, I find myself being renewed and um, determined to be a solution and to take initiative to move toward the other and not wait for them to move toward me. I would also suggest that uh, he could, this, I, I think it was Steve, a guy, was it a guy or I'm not sure. Michael, yeah. Michael, okay. I would just say that Michael, uh, one of the other things you can do, and I agree with both uh, Pastor Mondanay and Pastor uh, Jenkins, that uh, consider convening conversations among your friends uh, that look like you and don't. I would ask that he take the initiative with his parents and family members and neighbors to say, what can we do to try to be supportive and helpful? I'm going to say this as an advertisement to Pastor Mondanay, who heads the NAACP. Go to an NAACP meeting. Get involved in NAACP activities. You've, I don't, yeah, I think you cover this area too, is that right? Yeah. Okay. Um, also, find your way to the Urban League. There is also a group of young black men called Word is Bond. They would welcome you to give you the opportunity to both be a part and to make sure um, that you get connected. The last thing I would say, there are different student leaders. What's your name, son? Shamari. And I'm not saying that in any other way than deferential. As an elder, I call every young man a son. Okay? So they need to talk to Shamar. And Shamar will give them the rest of the answers. <laughs> and you guys, you two right here. Yeah. May add to that, um, yeah. uh, what I, I hesitate to share, however, I am an educator. And so it's very hard for me to hold back with these things. Um, and so 
I would say to anyone who's looking to help, to be an ally and how to help, first you have to be aware of yourself and what your biases are. Understandably, I have them as well, and I have to check myself constantly. I grew up in the Deep South, so I have a heightened awareness of what is going on around me and what I'm doing, where I'm going. Um, I would also encourage individuals who want to help and want to be allies, listen. Listen to your neighbors, listen to your friends, ask how are they hurting, how can they help? I, it's not going to be the same for everyone uh, on how you can help them. But we already know about the systems and the structures, but how do you help that individual? You have to listen and ask that person. Um, I'll always say um, acknowledge the fact that systematic racism does, it is in existence itself. Um, and black lives do matter. And again, that's not to say that anyone else's life doesn't matter, but until black lives matter, you can't say all lives matter. That's period, end of story, right? Um, the other thing is, when you hear the backhanded compliments, or you think you're complimenting someone, when you add in for a black person or for a black woman, I've been asked, I can't even tell you how many times in this community did I get this job because I'm a black woman. And my response has been, more lately, are you asking me that because you're white? And I know that's an offhanded piece, but don't get, try and give me a compliment and then in the end say it's because of, I like to think it's on my merits. I've worked hard for where I've, I've arrived um, and I'm here to do a task and a job. And I'm reminded of that job and that task every time I walk into a classroom, my students of color to see the representation, right? I'm a big girl, I'm hard to miss too. Um, and I'll end with this, uh, and I, this is a quote, and I don't wanna misquote Langston Hughes, so I will say this, uh, I will read it. Um, and it's called, Oh America, by Langston Hughes. It's, Oh America, let America be America again. The land that never has been yet, and yet must be the land where every man is free. How do we reach that goal? Those are words that were written decades ago, and we're still trying to live out that creed that we've all been promised. And just because I have some degrees and a job, I know I have not arrived. I'm reminded of that every single day I look in the mirror of who I am. But what I also know is lastly, uh, I said that three sentences ago, is that I can't always be out front. I'm not, I cannot always be out front. As a woman of color, I know my, I have to lead from behind in some scenarios, and this is one. So you will not see me out and about doing this, that, and the other, but you gotta know, I'm working with the undercurrent. I'm from the deep, deep south now. I mean, you know, we all aspire to be you guys. Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. I wouldn't charm in on that. So you asked the question, what can we do out here at East? There's an organization already out here East called Beyond Black. There's programs already out here East. Weirdness not necessary to say you gotta go to NAAC. Me and Pastor talk. Urban League, you have an organization right out here representing everything you want black. Everything you want black, you already got it right here, right now, already doing this work. Maybe we just small and maybe we don't get all that. We already here. Guarantee y'all brothers already fit. You walk in the door, we got you. That's guarantee. You yes, me and you just talked about. I got you. Here we go. You want to represent? What, what position you want to pick? What you want to do? It's here. It's here right now. Just open up. We'll guide you through them doors, because we all here talking about how we gonna walk through that door. So when you want to know the answer, we right here. It's right here, right now, happening. Right now, happening. Playgirl Lawrence here. We do the youth work. You want a job tomorrow? We got you, right now. Here we go, right now. Just find it and we'll make it happen in all the school districts. Yes, one of them kids want to get hired, we'll put you in the right position. It's happening right now. Right now, as I speak. We're sending them what school you want to go to, right? We know the problem in Gresham. We know the problem in Rose. We know the problem in Centennial. We know all them problems. We know what's up. 
They don't look like us. That's why them kids ain't getting the championships. And we just can't camp academics. We know what's up. Hire us, look like us, it'll walk through that door. I swear to you. I swear to you. That's what's up. Mayor, this one is for you. Sharon T. says, what work is the city doing around diversity, inclusion, and education? What training is the council and mayor doing? We're good. It's a good, it's a good question. I'm going to be real honest about it. We tried to get into diversity, equity, inclusion, and we stumbled and we failed as, a, as an organization. Um, a lot of things happen, some of which I don't know, some of which I do, but the bottom line is it failed. Um, it's important to the council that we get it right. It's important to me and it's important to the community that we re-engage in that work and that's the work that we are re-engaging in, in, in diversity, equity, and inclusion, both internally so that we can have the internal conversation and then as well as, as this piece of the framework, how do we do that um, externally? Um, but I know that we have work to do internally that hasn't been done and we're late, we're behind. Um, and we need to get back at it. We're going to do that. Uh, Larry is leading up from our office is leading up the, the charge to begin with and, um, and all the way through. And, and I'm looking forward to the, to the conversations because I want to hear what Mr. Hennessy said about our employees' experiences. And I want them to be free and unencumbered to talk to us. And um, it makes it a little challenging under the construct of the governance of the city and the charter and all that gets a little bit difficult with employees, but that's okay, we'll figure that out. Um, but there's more, um, a lot of work to be reinstigated, restarted, and we're, uh, we're on the way to doing that. I would also offer, if I could, Mayor, yes, we've yeah. got people like Corey Falls, yep. your deputy city manager, uh, Dr. Holt, yep. Stephen Holt as well. Yep. I'm praying that you will utilize yep. their amazing vast yep. resource and knowledge and experience yep. in this regard as well absolutely absolutely this next question is for the pastors uh xavier c says what support or help are faith-based organizations churches and black organizations doing to help black families and people of color i want to help be an ally you know it would need to be a little more specific. I mean, in, in what areas is that education, healthcare, relief, that type of thing? Um, for us, anywhere that we see deficiencies, anywhere that we see gaps, we're going to do our best um, to serve those. And so, whether it be education enrichment, healthcare fairs, those type of things. So, um, that would obviously be focused on disadvantaged communities of every kind. So, I would just add thoughts on this as well. Um, every year for the last eight years, we've provided, uh, with the partnership of Concordia, tutoring services literally every Monday night from anybody from kindergarten all the way through uh, high school and college. Uh, we're looking for a new partner now. Uh, secondly, we do scholarships uh, every year, both for our young people as well as for we adopt seven schools in the region and provide an opportunity for after high school uh, things. We also are working uh, with hand in hand with the Urban League in terms of developing uh, opportunities for young people in uh, job creation and job opportunities and we're developing relationships with business around the area so that in the summertime young people have uh, places to go to work because quite frankly young people need to be uh, busy I'll just say that, amen. That's a father coming out, <laughs> but I'm just going to say that, amen. Go ahead. I partner with that thought of um, uh, associating with the Urban League. They have some incredible, pro uh, incredible programs. I know that at uh, Celebration Tabernacle, we have a program called Teach Me to Fish that kind of helps you energize the uh, the uh, guilt, the gifts and and resources within yourself to become an entrepreneur or to do those things that you could only imagine yourself doing uh, and to actually walk into those places. Um, so that's what we offer as well. The last thing we would say is <laughs> Saint Germain. 
<laughs> please just come home. I was going to say, just please come home. We do park work right now at the Docker Park. Please come home. We're going to help with the park department. Just come home. Reach out to us. We'll make sure it's okay. Please do. So we can hold them accountable. We will be back in here filling this whole auditorium up. Trust us. This question is more for anybody. Um, Rosa J says, I am new to East County. What is Oregon's race history specifically in the Portland region? Um, where is it at? I am new to East County. What is Oregon's race history specifically in the Portland region? I would say that we we would not have enough time to all of us to chime in on that, but that information is readily available on the internet. Simply Google, you can find it. The other thing I would suggest there's uh, I don't know whether Dr. Milner is still at Portland State, um, but if he's not, you can find him, Dr. Daryl Milner, who has done amazing work in this area has also gone back to show us property titles that specifically say all the way into the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, where black people or Jewish people were not allowed to purchase the property. If it was going to be conveyed to anybody else, it couldn't be them, if you will. Uh, he's got a plethora of that. But I will also say just uh, any of us of color, You've heard our credentials, you know what we do, but guess what? When I get in the car, if I get a call for one of our people is in Gresham, Tualatin, Portland, Vancouver, wherever they are, and it's two o'clock in the morning, I know who I am, I know my relationships, but if I'm in a speed limit, a speed zone that says 35, I put on cruise control. Because at two o'clock in the morning, I'm not sure whether somebody is lurking and if I am driving just a little bit faster than the speed limit, that I might not get stopped. Same is true about coming to a complete stop at a stop sign and get around the corner and see that there's somebody sitting there. I'm not, I'm not making this up. This is a reality. And as, as preachers, as black men, as, you know, perhaps black women as well, and I'll try and speak, Doc, for you, but I know very well we are con constantly conscious of who we are because we are not just in Portland or in Oregon or in Gresham, we are in the United States of America. Next question, Jean, Jean Anderson says, I have seen police and city leaders around the country walk in solidarity with groups and organizations. Does the city of Gresham plan on supporting the movements and marches? Let me, let me say from uh, my perspective, and I think Councillor Eccles spoke to some of it in terms of uh, her statement that she'll offer uh, for next uh, uh, Tuesday's council meeting, uh, which clearly identifies the need to support um, peaceful, uh, uh, peaceful protests. The council, the governance, has been engaged in this process. The council has attended um, the rallies that have been put on. Uh, I spoke at one of them. I know other counselors have been and, and have spoken. Um, the police department um, needs, to en needs to engage in this conversation and they need to be a willing partner. That is my expectation. That is what the council's expectation is. And to the accountability piece, that'll be what is absolutely expected. I expect our officers to engage with our community. I expect them to understand and hear the voices that were said today and that continue to be said. I do not believe this council has any ambiguity on that. I think there's no ambiguity on that. And that'll be part of the review that we committed to uh, from President Obama's plan, uh, as well as what we're going to commit to as a community together to uh, go through these issues. But my full expectation, and I want to be very clear, my full expectation is that the police department is a willing partner and understands their role in a modern day police department and in the reforms that are going to be necessary to move the community, our society, humanity forward. That's my expectation. 
Alright, so next question. Cherry W says, I have four black boys, all under the age of 10. What should I tell them? What can I do to protect them? Uh, my son's 10 too, and uh, we just have real conversations about things. My personal experiences that I've gone through, um, so he's aware and he knows what um, could happen. And also, um, I think uh, somebody else over there said um, the camera, or maybe it was over here, the camera needs to be out and it's powerful. And it, it's uh, sad to see that that's not going to um, be 100% safety. That's, that's not going to work. It needs to be a lot of change. But um, I just have to have those real conversations with my son. He's 10. Um, I worry about him each and every day, just like every other parent. And I worry about all of our kids. And I think as parents, it's up to us to have those real conversations because that's reality. And, and I'll add to that. Um, as I do not have boys, I do have young ladies. Um, and by saying that, I will say to you, uh, as a black mother, I worry about my daughters. I do not have sons. My sister has four boys as well. And I can tell you that almost every time we have a conversation, we're having conversations about as our boys grow. And they're eight, six, and she also has a set of twins like me that are two. Um, one, I would share that that parent works to teach th their child about their history um, and the realities of America. In the black household, there's no such thing as an age of innocence uh, when it comes to especially these sort of things. I can remember being six years old. My father was an officer of the law. We were a uniform every single day, uh, proudly. Um, but he also knew that there were people that were not good people on the force. And he would sit myself and my brother down on a regular basis and talk to us about things. Um, again, I can remember being six years old learning about those kinds of things. But learning, teaching them about the realities and about their own history. Uh, because I will say this as an educator and having worked in the corporate world with McGraw-Hill, the publisher, um, the history is not correct in the text, in the books. Um, and I, my skin cringes every time I have a parent demand a textbook. And I'm like, that is not the right place to find the information that you really want. Because it has a one story. And it, it doesn't tell the story, our story, of our collective United States. So I would share that that parent, again, teach your child about their history, teach them about the realities of, of America. Uh, that's not to say that that child can't be innocent and do the things that they need to do as a kid. Obviously keep it age appropriate. Um, but now is a time more than ever that we all have to lean in as parents. I would not only encourage that parent, but every parent to lean in with their children and let them know what's going on. It's going to be a challenge for my staff as our students return in the fall on how we deal with this and how we go forward. But it is important that that kid knows their history uh, and the history of America. And more importantly, even than that, that their parent loves them and is supportive. I would just like to chime in one time because I have four boys. And my job is to keep having that hard conversation where people with titles, right? My job is to keep them safe is continue to have this hard conversation. Before I came here this morning, I talked to a 75-year-old white man that's a Christian out in Rockwood. We have a relationship. And I will tell him, and he asked me, Jermaine, what can I do? We're going to continue to have that real conversation. How we have that conversation of where we all going to be safe at, right? Where well, I'm going to take this conversation, what you're going to do to make sure we all are safe, right? He comes in and says, you man, I want to talk to you. We're going to have that real conversation. That's how we're going to keep these kids safe. Because it's human rights we're talking about. Yeah, of course we're talking about black. But until we all think all of us kids are human kids, this is his talk. Until you care about all our kids, we're talking about human kids. If you keep letting these kids die, then we ain't talking about human kids, right? We're just having a game play. He asked me, you go and say, do you really care? Do you really care? We're talking about a human. Hell with color, human, right? We're talking about you letting these kids die, and you're going to say, what can you do? You better have that conversation before one of your kids die. That's the conversation. That's how we keep them safe. 
let's keep having that tough conversation, that hard conversation, not just the conversation. Let's have that real conversation and what we're going to do about it. Because once we leave here, we need to be knowing what we're going to do about this. Not just talking to make us all be peaceful. What are we about to do here right now? Because all kids is involved in this, right? A human conversation. That's how we have that to keep them safe. Let's challenge people to have that tough, I'm talking about the hard, gut-wrenching, because Beavis, we know, it's, it's going to be some people pushing right now. Like, there's people pushing in this conversation as we have them pushing back on us. Right as we speak, there's people pushing. We got to have that real conversation, that real guard conversation. Everybody got to have that conversation. And can we show what we're talking about? Action, not talk. I would, I would echo that. I've, I've raised my children in Eugene, Oregon, and so we arrived here in 19, 1996, and I myself was raised by my great-grandfather, who was a, um, up, a descendant of a sharecropper slave up from the South, and um, one of the things that I recognized that I needed to do to educate, I guess that was the question, how do we educate? Um, I knew that I couldn't leave it to the school system to educate my children on um, their their cultures and their community's contribution to America. And so I wanted them to have a sense of pride, although obviously I'm a black father, we had the tough conversations that Jermaine speaks of. At the same time, I wanted them to have a sense of pride, a sense of dignity as they went about their lives in a white society to know that they could hold their head up and that they were the descendants of kings and queens and all of the contributions um, that our people have made throughout history. And so I took it upon myself to make sure that they had that and at the same time I gave them a sense of responsibility to be to turn adversaries into advocates by the way they conducted themselves in the public space and so they to this day as young adults um, are, are understanding that they're introducing themselves and our culture and our people to someone every day and I wanted them to carry the weight not just of Jenkins it's unfair uh, and yet I wanted them to know that they were my children and I had an expectation and yet they had this whole culture, this community um, that was supporting them, that they could be proud to be a part of, and I wanted them to represent themselves well and comport themselves well in the public space. One other comment to that, and that is that I, I've, with our children, both that have been raised in our, our house, but also at our church, um, I, when they bring uh, kids over, their friends that are, that are Caucasian, I've made it clear if something goes, something happens, you're to stay right there. I'm going to talk with your parents to make sure they know that your job is not to walk away, not to run away and be safe and leave our kids right there with the police or with whatever friction is going on, and that, that Caucasian parents can be extremely helpful to help their kids understand whether it's when they're in, uh, I don't care, K-12 all the way into college and high school, what, high school, college, whatever it is, their job is to also remember, if you're an ally, then stay one when trouble comes. One more thought I have is, I haven't heard this. I, I raised two twin boys here in Portland. They're 38 years old now. I've got five grandchildren. Tell them the truth. And above all, teach them not to fear. This next question comes from Lori Stegman, the Multnomah County Commissioner. And she says, what is Gresham doing currently around the lack of diversity training? I think we just answered that in the yeah. previous question. Um, but I can repeat it again if that's helpful. The Again, the, the diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, team is uh, getting together and ready to launch. Larry has been doing work with getting some uh, folks on board to do the work and to uh, get after all of the work that needs to be done internally. And happy to speak to the commissioner uh, candidly or, or more directly on that issue as well. And the last question is, it's a community-based question. Um, how will Gresham and the discussion won't end here? How can we assure we're making progress and what checks and balances can be used going forward? It's, it's a fantastic question and it is the question. And it's the question that Jermaine uh, is, is, has, has raised a couple times. Where do we go from here? And um, after today, 
uh, my intent is to get back together with the Gresham City Council to figure out as, and to have a conversation and a dialogue on what are the next steps in terms of a community process. We know that the community process um, is the avenue, is the thing, and um, to that end, everybody is committed to getting folks together to go through that process to hear um, where resources uh, are, are needed to talk about where systemic problems lie, to open up the door to free conversation. That is our commitment. That is my commitment. Um, specific date, I do not have, uh, you know, sitting here right now, here today, a time because the council needs to get together and discuss it. But I understand the urgency of the moment, as I said in my opening comments, and I think the council does as well. Um, and uh, there is a lot of work that is, you know, going on right now that isn't formalized in a community setting that once we get the community together uh, which makes it challenging with the covid situation um, but i think we'll figure that out um, but that 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 is that is where we are so more um, obviously a definitive more plan the council will meet tuesday the 16th um, uh, this next tuesday um, where this plan we can talk about going through some of the outlines of the president of president obama's plan um, set the stage for the accountability piece of that, the review piece of the review of of the department, um, but that again is one piece of the overall larger com conversation. So all that to say that the council um, is ready to get to work. We just need to have a conversation together as a council. Go ahead. I, I just got to say, what well, Mayor, can you commit that we're going to have a thirty-day plan? a 60-day plan, and a 90-day plan, because we don't want this to keep going further and further and further, right? J Let's get, this is get to us some. Jermaine, I hear you. Yes. I, I am not interested. Action. Jermaine, I, I'm committed to it. I've okay. told you that three times. I am not interested in having meetings to have meetings. I'm not interested in having pastels and dot exercises and all that stuff. I'm interested in meaningful, generational conversations that move our humanity to a better place. I'm absolutely, Jermaine, Jermaine, I'm absolutely committed to it. I promise you. And we all will be back with that, okay. I promise you. Um, Mayor, if I can, oh. Go ahead. I, just to, to tag on to that is I read in the beginning our draft statement of truth, intention, and commitment, and that is just one step, and as I said, at that time, the council is asking you to hold us accountable to this statement. What's missing in it is the what's the hows and the winds, and we recognize that. Um, and there's a lot of work to do that. And um, time is of the essence. I hear you that it's we we can't just pass this on Tuesday and go, gee, we just did a great job, and then put it on the shelf. We understand that it's the it's one first step. And please do inform, challenge, hold us accountable. And I'll just add one, again, now more than ever, we need to remain committed to the work that we are doing. Um, what I know about people um, is that when things become challenging and people question their character um, and people get angry and they push back, sometimes people shy away from those type of things. Um, and I will include myself in that category as well. Um, in fact, in my last post as superintendent doing this work, uh, my family had security for three months. Now, why would you ask an educator needs security? Because people do not want these things to advance and go forward because of their own benefit. But this time, more than ever, we need to remain committed. Um, and I'm going to quote another great person. This Kareem Abdul-Jabbar is a former college athlete. I do emphasize former, which is why I'm paying back all my scholarship money to orthopedics. Um, he shared an article not too long ago in the... Um, I think that the LA Times that racism itself is like dust in the air. It seems invisible, even if you're choking on it, and until you let the sun in, then you see it everywhere. As long as we keep shining the light, we have a chance. And that is my thought and my hope. Something else. I would like to add personally to that is it's not just on um, the mayor and the city council to do something. I think the community also has to do something. You have pastors up here, you have myself, you have Jermaine, Jalen right here. Um, the community, you guys need to get out and go join the protest. You know, go hear what everyone is saying and, you know, you, you be the change that you want to see. 
So come to us with ideas, all of us up here, come to us with ideas and voice your opinions and things that you want to be changed. So when we come up here, we can be a voice for you guys to get the community heard and get the changes that you guys want to see in the community. Okay, further questions, comments, closing thoughts? Three preachers don't have a closing thought? How about that? <laughs> We've always got Three stuff. Preachers. Yeah, right. And two superintendents. And two, okay. The educator does in that. <laughs> I will close with one thought that, you know, racism itself, it needs people to believe in the ideals that of, of racism. It does not like those who can critically think and think differently. And I'll leave with that. I would just say that it takes courage to even convene today. And I want to really applaud you. And I know you don't need that from me. I, I don't. I, but but, that feels but hang really with awkward. me. Hang, no, hang with me. You didn't have to do it. Yeah. You didn't have to, uh, counselor, you didn't have to bring this forward, you two, right? But you are. It is those intentionalities that is so important so that, again, I've said in meetings, all of us who are brown or black have said in meetings, thankful that we're not the ones that have to bring it up. But, but most often, we are the ones that have to bring it up. And people get very uncomfortable when we do. So again, I'm grateful. And uh, again, we're with you as you move forward. I, I have a little different take than Pastor Hennessy. Um, and he's heard me say this before. I'm grateful that you're here, and I'm thankful that you're here, but I'm glad to see that you're doing your job. Your job is to show up when we're in trouble. That's what you're paid for. And we, are, we sit in these places uh, where we've been uh, instituted as leaders. I'm thankful that you're acting like a leader. And if you can't take any other uh, gratitude in other than that, uh, be sure that we see you doing your job. Okay. Well, thank you everyone for uh, your time. Uh, I think it was a productive conversation that's going to lead to action, Jermaine. And um, I look forward to our next steps as a council and as a community. And thank you all for being here. Thank you. <laughs>